Good afternoon, and thank you for standing by. Welcome to the AFS Best Practices webinar. Our topic today is AFS is helping banks spring into SOFR, an AFS LIBOR, LIBOR update webinar. Our webinar will be approximately an hour long, and our first speaker today is Dean Snyder, Managing Director, AFS Vision. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like what is currently on the screen on your computer desktop in the upper right corner. To enable open dialogue, we will be unmuting all lines. However, we would ask that you mute your own line on your device until you would like to speak. To help us manage those that would like to ask a question or make a comment, we ask that you use the raise the hand feature, which you can see outlined here on the screenshot. Additionally, you can use the Q&A feature to ask questions. We will leave some time during the presentation and, and at the end of the presentation so that we may answer as many questions as possible. You also see the Q&A box outlined on this screenshot. We are recording today's session and tomorrow you will receive an email with a link to listen or download the presentation. Thank you for joining us today, Dean. Thank you, Renee, and welcome everyone to today's webinar. And pardon me, I'm going to remove that from our screen. All right, today's agenda, we are going to talk about recent LIBOR SOFR transition news, and certainly a very popular topic these days, observation shift and some of the other things that are being finalized. Uh, and then we will actually have live demonstration from level three of how some of the compounding and arrears functionality uh, will be working. We're showing you, you know, from our development environment. And then we'll have some also previews from AFS Vision for that same functionality. And then we also have a special topic today, which is so for impacts to estimate a billing. We're going to have some of our colleagues from M&T Bank who have raised some questions about uh, billing scenarios when you start using the SOFA rates, and we'll have a discussion about that, and then we can talk about some of the questions we've gotten and what our next steps are going to be. So again, welcome to the webinar today. It's May 20th, and we almost can start seeing the, end, the light at the end of this tunnel. With, with SOFR, uh, I think we're starting to come around the final turn. Uh, certainly been a lot of preoccupation with COVID-19 and as always, we hope everyone is, is staying healthy and safe as we endure um, those, those situations. But today we will focus back to LIBOR transition and SOFR. And on this slide, you uh, can see uh, of course, some of the recent news is coming out of the UK. Uh, they were the ones who first, I think, set a new deadline, which, or a new target date, I guess, of being ready in fourth quarter of 2020 for SOFR issuances. Uh, there has been a more recent announcement from the FCE and Bank of England that that date is being pushed into the first quarter of 2021. Uh, we have not changed, as we said before, we have not changed uh, our timetables. And I think from what I'm hearing from the banks here in the US, uh, they're trying to stick to the, the fourth quarter timetable as well. Um, we also, of course, heard from the Main Street Lending Program a few weeks ago and the announcement that the, the pricing for Main Street loans was going to be SOFR based. And since then, there was an announcement or a revision to that guidance to say that Main Street loans will not have to be SOFR-based, but they can still be LIBOR-based, I think, opening up an option. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, we're watching very closely the SOFR rate uh, market and um, the, the establishment of SOFR forward term rates so that uh, borrowers and lenders will have options to use that type of rate structure similar to the way LIBOR works today. And 
uh, if you haven't been on the website lately, the New York Fed website where they publish the SOFA rates, uh, here's a, a picture of one of the more recent days showing you the additional rates that have been added or have been published uh, on the Fed website. Now, um, to talk a little bit about observation shift, I'm going to ask Charles Wambua from AFS if he can update us. Charles has been our lead person on the our committee working group. Uh, Charles, how are we doing? Uh, thank you, Dean, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, at this point, uh, from the latest discussions with the ARC, uh, we are actually we are coming to the final uh, piece of the deliberations around observation shift. The ARC understands all the complexities, and uh, back in April, they gave seven options and they asked for feedback, and the banks came back, and now it's been narrowed to two, and which which is um, compounding without um, observation shift, but you can still have a look back. And if you need to <clears throat> have observation shift, uh, there is an extra component to have a simple rate imputation. So those are the only two choices. For the vendors though, we are preferring to have look back with no observation shift because it takes away a lot of um, uh, the complexities, especially with the trading aspect, and also it's already built, right? We've been building this uh, from um, early last year, so we know that we don't have uh, issues with uh, compounding without the observation shift. So the, I know there are questions around the calendar day look back with observation shift and simple rate imputation. The easiest way <clears throat> to understand it is each and every single day uh, of the week will actually have a weight of one. And Friday, just like today, we'll, uh, we'll just multiply it by three to cover Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. But the caveat is this. Holidays will not be treated the same way we treat holidays, holidays today as quote unquote non-business days. On holidays, that's when we'll have that simple rate imputation, which means we'll just take the latest, uh, the latest published rate and use it to compound the interest on that holiday. So the holiday, if it fell on a Wednesday, uh, we'll use a rate that was used on Tuesday and we'll compound on that Wednesday with a weight of one, as opposed to previously trying to compound with a weight of two. So that's the, that's the main difference. Now, if, if the market participants uh, do not go with our preferred method, which is without observation shift, if they have to use this one, uh, we have to let everyone know that this is not built by uh, any of the, uh, of the vendors. This is something new that we would have to do. And there's possibility of delaying <clears throat> in top because of uh, new coding and testing. So you might have um, a delay in terms of uh, delivery. So that's something I want to stress. And that's why vendors are preferring the no observation shift. So the meeting was supposed to be today with the ARC to get feedback that was due uh, from the market participants as of Monday this week, uh, but they canceled because they had a conflict. So our next meeting is next Wednesday at 2 p.m. to get feedback and then from there we can proceed with uh, uh, necessary coding. Um, the other part I wanted to raise is um, just uh, the updates from the ARC on the waterfall approach. Um, I know every, everyone by now knows the hardwired and the amendment approach. Uh, and with the hardwired, we know we start with the TOM and then we go to the compounded uh, SOFR. And if that's not possible, then we go to, uh, we leave it to the borrower and the agent to select their own replacement rate. The reason I'm pointing this whole fallback approach is 
let the latest conversation out there is actually to see if it's possible to replace the compounded SOFA step, uh, step number two, and replace it with simple SOFA. So that would make it easier to implement, uh, easier to manage from an operations perspective. Uh, we're still waiting to get um, confirmation from the ARC on that piece. And I think the deadline for feedback from the market participants is the 22nd. So that's Friday, uh, end of day Friday. So that's a highlight that I wanted to raise on that topic. Yeah, thanks, Charles. Uh, appreciate the update. Uh, and, and always, too, uh, when we mention other vendors, we're certainly not officially representing the points of view from the other vendors. We are in communication through the ARC working group. Uh, so uh, I just want to be careful and be fair. It's it's certainly an, an interesting situation because the other vendors obviously are we're all competitors on a certain level, but also need to be collaborators on a different level. Uh, but uh, mostly, of course, we are deferring to what the market decides in terms of functionality and so forth. And uh, so when we say uh, preference, it is something that we've offered up. But I want to make sure we're not speaking officially for any of the other vendors we're speaking from an afs perspective okay and now i'm going to hand this over to uh, our level three team and i think it's going to be uh rich coogan right that um is going to give us a little bit of demonstration out of level three yep so hold on and let me give you control here, Rich. There you go. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, as you know, um, AFS has been active, an active participant in all the ARC and business loan working group calls and meetings from the very beginning of this project. Um, we are level three, and I'm sure Lena will tell you AFS vision is on track. For our June, well, we have a June 30th delivery date for the compound and the rate for SOFR. Uh, there still are a couple of issues that we need final guidance on from the ARC and the banks. Um, Charles mentioned the observation shift. There's also a question out there about floors and whether the floor would be calculated by taking the, the SOFR rate plus the credit spread adjustment and then flooring that rate or if they're taking the 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 sofa rate plus the credit spread adjustment plus your margin and and um meaning the all-in rate and flooring that rate so there's a question there as to how that will be handled we're hoping to get final guidance on that in the next week or so so we can we can finish that up uh, we have been testing um the code for quite some time now and all our results have been positive. We've been matching up with various spreadsheets that, that we have and that we've received from the ARC um, and also matching up with our uh, our other team members who are working on the vision side, you know, matching up all the accruals and the billings and everything like that and, and everything is is matching up fine. So now I just wanna take you into the system and, and show you a couple quick examples. Um, the first screen I'm showing you is just the base rate sc uh, screen. So this is our SOFR index, um, and the only reason I'm bringing this up is just to show you that it's just set up like any other rate, uh, any other LIBOR or prime rate that you may set up in level three. You just go in, create the index and your SOFR and update it each day, and you're good to go. So again, the purpose of that was just to uh, show you um, it's just like any other rate. Now I have um, a loan that I started to set up um, in the system and a partially there, so in a second. So this is new today. I said I did the disbursement and did some other things, but I haven't done the, um, the accrual uh, or the, um, you know, setting up the SOFR work that you have to do. So the first thing, looks just like any other loan when you're doing the accrual you'll just set it up it happens to be five, uh, five on 20 the basis remember the basis um 
there isn't going to be a 30 over 360 basis with any of these compounded rates. That's it has to be um, it can't be a 30 day month, uh, you know, and that 30 over 360 calculation. So the you can enter a rate, and that's it. Um, the only other thing I wanted to point out here is when um, we're not going to talk about compounding the balance today, but the difference for compounding the balance. When you're setting up a rate to compound the balance and not the rate, you would enter the, a balance type of 010 here, and that 010 would tell the system that it's going to you're going to be compounding the balance and not the rate. Okay, so that it's that simple. There's no new fields uh, that you have to worry about. Then your 1360, which is your prime schedule, and turning it on. So 5120, uh, the base number was 005. So if it's a daily, uh, same thing, you know, your day code is 01. Now, a change here, the number of months is being used for look back days in this case, when you have have this uh, daily and the, and the type code turned on down here. So we're gonna say it has five look back days, um, nothing for the floor and ceiling yet. Uh, we can do a, a cap type one, which is maybe your normal spread um, calc type two, maybe could be your spread adjustment. Now, if you are already using um, both calc types already on a loan, then you would have to go to an additional charge code like charge code 101 to capture the, um, the spread adjustment. Okay. And then um, just your anniversary date. And then it's an adjust. So these are the type codes. So a six is a loan without, you know, compound the rate without observation shift. The five is compound the rate with observation shift. Okay. Well, oh, I put in the wrong, I put in 27. No wonder. Bear with me. I practiced this and had no problems. 20. Okay. So that's that's all you got to do. There's there's no new fields. Um, there's some repurposed fields. Like I said, the number of months we are using some of these. You know, we just added another type code to accommodate the observation shift and not observation shift. There are some fields in the background that have been created for reset dates because you know on the compounding rate, once you know you're going to get ready to bill the next month, your observe your um you. You have to reset the dates so you can start again with a new rate on that on that day. Okay. And just some examples. Of course, my other phone has to ring now. Apologize for that. Um, another loan that's already set up that I can show you what it looks like. You know, after. So just a regular loan. You know, every, you know the good thing with AFS at level three. Everything works the same, basically. It's just different codes and things you can enter to trigger this new this new processing. Um, and then a loan that's been out there for a while, you're going to see these compounded rates every day. Uh, so the, if the rate doesn't change, you know, you'll which we've seen with the SOFA rates on occasion, they don't change for a couple of days. You'll see that a new rate isn't entered. So you will see that your your um, your interest in fee schedule screen, your inquiry is gonna have these out there for every day. So, you know, be ready for that. So learn how to, to put, enter a date if you wanna go to a later date or a page through if you don't wanna be looking from the very beginning, okay? Um, and again, this one was set up the same way that I set up the one uh, before your effective fund date. We actually had backdated this guy, so you can backdate them, uh, the prime, your anniversary date, you know, started from the beginning. Uh, alternate calendars, I wanted to say one thing about the calendars. So in level three today, you have your calendars where you can uh, use uh, LIBOR as an alternate calendar. And then another, another version of that. And so if you just wanted to use the LIBOR calendar and look for a business day on that, you can use that. Or you can look for where the, uh, the LIBOR and the US calendar are in sync and they're in, you know, similar business days. So we, we had to add something for uh, SOFR because there, there will be a SOFR calendar um, that isn't gonna match up exactly with the US calendar. For example, like um, Good Friday is not a business day in the SOFR world. 
So it's going to be another alternate calendar with values different, you know, same th same kind of thing with LIBOR, but with SOFR. So if you're not using that today for LIBOR, you probably won't be using that going forward. But uh, just so you know, that's something we had to do for, for the alternate calendar there. And again, the change day um, is daily. Number of months is really uh, look back days in this case. Um, compound with no observation shift, no round. Um, so that that's basically it. Um, there really is no new fields that you need to worry about with compounding the rate um, that you know you need to adjust for in your masks or anything like that. So uh, it's really a pretty simple process. We're, we're uh, well on our way with testing. Uh, we we will we had sent out a preliminary document about how you um, how you do this. And uh, we'll be updating that once we get more clarification on the observation shift and the um, the floors, because some things have changed in there uh, from the from the initial document. Um, just some of the wording on some of the edits and messages and things like that. So uh, we're well on our way, and uh, that is it for for level three. And now I want to uh, send it over to Lena Gupta who will be presenting for um, AFS Vision. And Lena, I think I sent it over to you. Yes, I got it, uh, Rich. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Lena Gupta, and I'm working as a, project, a product lead on the servicing side. So for the next few minutes, I will be walking us through the enhancements that we have made in AFS Vision to incorporate the SOFA functionality. So as you saw, Rich walked us through the level three green screen. I will be uh, demonstrating the compounded rate changes in our web-based real-time application AFS Vision. Uh, I'm also planning to provide a sneak peek on our compounded balance functionality, which is still under development but it will give an overview of our design approach of how we are building or matching both the functionality for compounded rate as well as a compounded balance in AFS vision. So let's jump into the system. As you can see, this is what we have. It is called as a landing page or welcome center or a message center. So this helps me pick and choose the different modules of functionality in AFS vision like your originations uh, workflow or a syndication workflow or uh, viewing something directly in servicing which is where the loan resides after approval or funding and booking so for today's uh, demo perspective i will be focusing on how your loan looks once it's funded and how your sofa loan looks when it is funded and booked and how the accruals look how are the different components and what type of online reporting you can perform for your super loan. So let's jump on the account servicing. I will select that option here uh, to go to account servicing. So as I'm navigating, I can navigate through customer. I can search for the customer that I have created my oblig or obligation, or I can quickly make use of this existing quick search fun functionality where I can just simply type in my obligor and obligation and navigate directly to that obligation. Clicking on search. So this brings me directly to my customer, uh, the obligor and the specific obligation that I have set up for the demo. So I'll start with the change that we have. The first change that we incorporated was on our obligation notebook, where we added the field called as fallback language. That this field, as you can see, is basically a yes no field. So it will we understand that from a credit agreement perspective, our clients will have um, something on the fallback if there is a fallback language associated when the loan reprises, will that be changing? So this field we added here so that it will help uh, our clients to report uh, or leverage this field because we are also passing it in our, um, what we have it is a vision data extract, which is a raw data 
um, extract or download from our servicing side, which you can utilize to do your downstream reporting or analytics or any managerial reporting. Or this will help identify what loans have a fallback language associated with it. So that was the first change that was on the obligation notebook. Moving on to the charge header. So once you have created the loan, you have funded, you're booked, now you are setting up your charge header uh, along with it to accrue uh, interest. So the changes that we did on this first thing was, um, we have a field what is the accrual method. So this field is basically dictating what type of accrual or how the how that interest ch interest charge header is going to accrue will it be a simple interest which was today how we supported libor then we added some new valid values so this field is a system defined pick list valid value we added additional pick valid values to the field which drives additional functionality so we added both flavors as we heard earlier in this webinar on the flavors of observation shift or without observation shift. So depending on what your credit agreement has, you can set up the loan as compounded rate without observation shift or with observation shift. And same thing with compounded balance. So if you're planning to use compounded balance, so for a methodology, you would use these options when you're creating the charge header. These, uh, the, these fields or this information of how you're creating it is done across the board in the application. So if you're originating through a workflow and origination or your post approval, or if it's your syndicated deal and you're originating in syndications workflow through deal pipeline, you would have the same functionality there to ensure that when you're starting the loan origination process or the deal process, you would be able to make the right selection. So that was the first change that we did on the accrual method. The next change or couple of changes that we have here is on our index rate schedule. Um, so first thing, um, different rates, index rates, there's no change to that. How you set up your LIBOR, your prime, et cetera rates. You can set up your SOFA rates in system admin. The different, you can set it up multiple SOFA rates. There is no limitation or restriction. Um, if you're setting up with as a tenor, 30 days, 90 days, 20 days, depending on how your index or how you're planning to feed the loan system on those SOFA rates. So there's no change. It's just setting up. It's a parameter. It's a setup and system administration. The new field that we added here is on look back days. So look back days is not necessarily new with SOFA, but this functionality now actually is driving how many days back, how many business days back you have to go and interrogate the published rate. So this is an input field, depending on your credit agreement, whatever is the look back days or what is defined or agreed upon with the borrower, you can enter the look back days. So whatever is this so far published rate is and what um, the index rate that you're associating your charge header and the look back days, you will go that many X days and get, get that day's published rate. The system is going to do that uh, automatically. So in addition to this, we had our margin fields that we support our calculation type one and two. We understand there was a need to add this additional spread adjust, adjustment field. This may be temporarily, but we do felt the need of uh, when, especially when you're transitioning your LIBOR loans into SOFA for for an interim period, you may be applying an additional spread adjustment so that it can sync up or match for the transition period. So we added this spread adjustment, which can add, which is over and above on your existing margin fields. You can add, subtract different options. Again, this is a parameter. You select the option and en enter your spread adjustment. It will accordingly calculate on top of your margins to the all-in rate, and that's how you'll get your all-in rate. So uh, we also added this additional compounding reset date cycle frequency, which kind of works like your anniversary date. The different flavor here is uh, this is a day that dictates as you are compounding your rate. This date will dictate that 
maybe as a as a 30 day tenor or 90 day tenor this on this particular date there will be no compounding it's basically resetting and utilizing the publish rate so that's what this uh, date cycle is going to do and as rich was mentioning calendars from a vision perspective um, there's no limitation of the number of calendars you can create. You can have your LIBOR, you can have a US calendar, or you can create a new SOFA calendar and then accordingly tied to your charge header. This is all a setup and system admin. It's already available out of the box. It's just a matter of fact, creating that calendar and then associating, picking and choosing which calendar you want to uh, use for compounding cycles. So these were some changes, high-level changes that we did on top of um, the uh, uh, interest charge header when you are creating and added some additional checks and validation to maintain the data integrity as you're creating your char interest charge header. I do have an existing charge header here to demonstrate that once you've created it, how your accruals look like and how those individual components that are required to create your compounded rate, you can see them on the screen or how system is automatically calculating those for you. So I'll click on the view charge header. So some uh, 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 additional enhancements we create, we defined or we created for a charge header was like adding the accrual method so that it's viewable easily of what or how your charge, he charge header is accruing. Is it a simple, it's compounded rate, it's with observation without or what if it's compounded balance so you would be able to see that easily as part of your other charge header fee then we added some additional date filter criteria so that you are able to view you can change the filter criteria and view the limited results if you're looking or investigating uh, of for a certain day how your what was your all-in rate how it was computed so as I was saying, it's very important to make sure that uh, how system has computed the rate, especially on when you are like on a syndicated deal, or if you have to explain to your borrower um, that how the system computed or how you arrived at that compounded rate, it's easier, it will be nice to have the functionality to view all those individual components, and hence we added all those each and every field to be available to our users to view it on the screen. So if you get a call from your customer, customer, your customer service department gets an inquiry like for a certain billing period, how is my rate computed or what additional fees were there or if there is a disagreement from your member bank or from another application saying there is a dis disconnect on the rates, this, this view will provide you that visibility of how those individual components, what was your accrual days, what your weight, basis, et cetera. So we added those individual and the new fields. So suddenly it shows you what your what was your balance on a given day, what the primary balance was, what accrual system computed for that day, what was the number of accrual days, the weight, which specially comes in play if you're using the observation shift. So all those nuances. And then in addition, like this is what system computed your all in rate. So we are showing as what was the published rate like what was sent uh, through your index rate like when you created what is the original base rate how system computed the effective rate which is the first component when we have to compute the compounded rate and the next is the cumulative compounded rate non-cumulative compounded rate and then finally we get that annualized rate then we add the spread the margins your calculation type one, two, and then spread adjustment, and then we arrive at your all-in rate. So basically, all those important parameters or the components to compute your compounded rate, we have added on the screen, and also to show you the calc type, the spread adjustment, and then finally, today, the total all-in earnings that you see as, or in short, your own inception to date is what you would see here as well. So this view, uh, again, we have added additional uh, functionality like filters so that you can filter it uh, for a certain month, certain day, date range to narrow down to certain criteria. The other good feature is the grid um, 
you can export it in an Excel. You can pick and choose what columns you would like to export, or you can export it all, and it will bring up an Excel spreadsheet for you with, this, with the same components, so that's easy to view or share or print across the team. So this is what you would see with all the individual components as I was showing, as I was scrolling it further, all this information is available in an Excel form. Um, in addition to these export feature that I was demonstrating, what we have in AFS version is our online reporting capabilities, which we call it as a printable inquiry. So we have a predefined um, list of printable inquiries or reports that we can generate online. So we had a bunch of existing uh, reports that we already enhanced to add this additional field. In addition, if you would like this grid functionality that I was demonstrating, if you want it in a PDF format so that the data cannot be massaged or changed, we created a new printable inquiry called a charge balance activity detail. So when you render that printable inquiry, you can add a date filter criteria if you want to narrow down to a certain date range or if you click on accept, this is where it will quickly bring it up for you and give you all the data about that specific, your oblig or obligation, what accrual method, what's the all in rate, and then the individual days calculation. So 520, what is the balance? What is your accrual amount? And how those individual components were computed? So the same information can also be available in a PDF if you just want to view it, share it in a viewable format or a readable format. So these were some high level changes that we uh, made in the system for compounded uh, rate. The other one of the good PIs uh, I do want to show is we also enhance, as I said, the existing PI. We have something like a one-stop report. So all these components, like it gives you a snapshot or a summary of your obligation. So we did add it, those additional information, your additional spread adjustment, in the calc type factors here, we added the look back base um, and the accrual method and the new fields on this report as well. So this was on a high level a summary of um, so far rate um, or compounded rate changes. But as I mentioned earlier, I do want to um, on a high level touch upon uh, the new the changes that we are implementing right now are still under development phase on compounded balance. So. From a components perspective, like the new fees that we added, like compounding reset date, the look back days, uh, the annualized rate. So some of those uh, fields we are certainly leveraging for compounded balance. In addition, our approach is going to be um, creating a new balance header um, called as compounded balance, which system will automatically create as the loan is dispersed. And if your principal balance is accruing on a compounded balance accrual method. So we created a new balance type as a compounded balance. So this will be, this is all automated process. System will on a daily basis increase this compounded balance. It will automatically force increased transactions or decrease uh, transaction depending on what your accrual was on a prior business day. So whatever the accrual amount, every early morning as the system is posting, it will update this balance. And if there is any payment, like a principal payment that updates, that changes or affects your accrual amount, or if there is a rate change or if there's an interest payment, all these triggers are automatically going to update the balance. Now, what is accruing off that balance? This balance is not going to GL because your actual earnings are but what goes to your general ledger is the interest, the interest upon interest or the compounded interest that we are adding or accruing on top of this compounded balance, which is a new charge header. Again, system will be automatically creating this charge header for you, which will accrue on your, um, the new accrual balance code will be on this new compounded balance. And the same information of the charge header that you see on your primary charge header or the one that is accruing on your principal balance, you would see those same information. The only difference is this charge header is only accruing on the base rate and it does not have any spread or margin. That's the mark uh, or the market requirement that when you're compounding interest, it should only be uh, accruing on your base rate. 
and uh, not for disparate margin. And all the information on the balance activity, same as you could view on a primary charge. You could also see on this new charge header of how it's accruing um, on those new balance that system has created. And all the activity of how your balance gets updated, you can also view it under the balances. You can select that. And how system is increasing, decreasing, the same balance activity information, you can also view it on the grid and our online report uh, reporting capabilities. So this basically summarizes the SOFR enhancements that I wanted to demonstrate for today in AFS vision. I um, thank you for your time. Um, and with that, I would uh, like to pass the controls back to Dean Schneider to continue with the rest of the session. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Lena, and thanks. Uh, I think you've got an idea now of some of the work we've been doing, certainly the complexity around compounded in arrears. It's certainly going to be interesting as this new type of uh, accrual gets rolled out, right? Um, I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of challenges around servicing with the customer's billing statements and so forth. Um, there we go. Okay. Now, what I'd like to do now for our last section today is I'm going to have some of, again, our colleagues from M&T Bank speak about uh, some scenarios they've identified. And I think they're trying to work through how, I think the operational aspects of supporting um, the, the SOFR daily rates and, and what that means to borrowers as well as your staff who have to support the borrowers and uh, so i'm going to go ahead and let them uh chime in do i need to give a speaking role or are they ready to go renee um rebecca should be ready to go and then corey if you could unmute yourself okay. um, that would be good hi renee hi dean uh, thank you very much for this opportunity um, I'm not logged into the GoToWebinar, so I'll just, um, Renee or Dean, you'll be flipping the slides for us? Yes, I will, I'll be doing that. So we're on Thank the overview slide. Much. Thank you very much. So um, you're on page 10 then. Um, so this is uh, Rebecca yes. Bish from Commercial Product. And um, first of all, Dean and Renee and AFS, thank you for this opportunity uh, that you're giving us um, to present. We have been, as everyone is, uh, thinking about SOFR and the invoicing, and we surfaced an issue that we just wanted to share with the broader audience uh, to bring it forth. The slides are very self-explanatory. We'll just go through them pretty quickly, and I have colleagues on the phone as, as well. Um, so on the slide that we're currently on, uh, the current state, many of our customers today are priced on um, monthly LIBOR. So they're very familiar with it. They know what their payment is in advance, and the bill actually reflects the in actual interest that's due for that period. Uh, in the future state, when loans and customers move to SOFR, and in particular SOFR and arrears, with uh, the invoicing method that we're using today, which means in many cases mailing a physical bill, a portion of the, their monthly bill is actually going to be estimated using an indicative rate, and then they'll have a subsequent true up in the next month's bill. So the impact to our customers, um, they're going to see a summary debit or credit on the loan invoice that they're not used to, and they may have questions around that adjustment that they see. And what we're expecting is potentially a heavy burden that's going to be placed on the business line and also um, the customer operations um, support center uh, will, will then need to be explaining that reconciliation to customers. So we'll go to page 11 next. Some of the options that we've thought about for mitigation, um, all of them aren't available today or they're not practical really. Uh, so as everyone is aware, if forward-looking term SOFR were, were available right now or when LIBOR ceased, it, it would be very much like um, LIBOR and it wouldn't be an issue with invoicing uh, that we're expecting. If we were to use SOFR in advance, um, the issue that we see with that is, as everyone knows, the rate's scale and there's basis risk to a swap. Um, we could use a 10 or 15 day rate lock with 
without the subsequent true up, but then that's not really the actual interest uh, from the period. So it's a little bit sloppy, if you will. But something else that we had talked about was using a look back, uh, but there's concern around the accelerated invoicing and payment cycle that would be associated with, with that. Um, and we also thought about an auto debit with a one day payment notice, uh, but there's concern around wide customer acceptance. And then similar to the swap um, side, they use a payment delay. However, that doesn't work for loan facilities that have a scheduled principal repayment. Um, so just, uh, we expect to kind of have a short-term painful process that we go through as customers transition from LIBOR to SOFR uh, if they don't end up falling back to a forward-looking term rate and we end up on uh, SOFR in arrears when LIBOR ceases. So we'll go to page 12. And this is a sample bill. Uh, it's for a very simple loan, a $500,000 loan. And it just shows the indicative rate that's used for an estimated interest payment from February 19th to February 28th, uh, where there's an estimate that's provided for the amount of interest due for that period. And then on page 13, this just shows the adjustment. Now the adjustment is small. For this example, it was only $1.25. And in a either a raising or declining rate environment, that could go up or down. And then as the loan amount increased, it would go up linearly with that. But really the complexity is the reconciliation to be able to show the walk in that adjustment. And really it's incumbent upon the bank uh, to be able to explain that rec reconciliation to customers, uh, the accruals for that period using that indicative rate. Um, so today at MNC, roughly a quarter of our customers use a daily LIBOR rate and 75% are on a monthly LIBOR rate. But when LIBOR ceases, we expect a drastic increase on cust the customers that use a uh, daily SOFA rate. Um, so we expect a big uptake in that. And then moving on to page 14. This is the uh, requested functionality that we were thinking of. Um, so the example is simple interest in arrears and it has a the 10 day uh, rate lock with the true up and this just shows the reconciliation. Uh, we were thinking it could be an insert in the invoice uh, that would be sent to customers, so it would be self-explanatory. Uh, that being said, if it was compound in arrears, there would be additional complexity potentially because only the benchmark is compounded. The uh, lending margin and the benchmark rate adjustment, as everyone knows, is simple interest. Um, so then on page 15, uh, we just wanted to open this up if other banks or FIs are seeing something similar or how you work to mitigate the issue. Uh, and we were also looking to collaborate with others if anyone else is interested in helping develop requirements for this functionality. And Corey Maris, uh, who's on the call as well, um, and this is Rebecca Bish, if someone reached out to AFS, um, you could. Uh, um, Renee or AFS will put you in touch with us and we can work together to collaborate and develop requirements. Th thanks, Rebecca. Um, Renee, are the lines open now if anyone wants to, to jump into the conversation? Uh, yes, I have opened the lines, although as requested, everybody has self-muted, so um, they would need to right. unmute themselves. So again, if, if anybody wants to make any comments today, that is fine. Uh, but as well, if you'd like to get back to us at AFS, uh, we can uh, organize a group discussion. Again, um, we appreciate That's great. The, yeah, the people from MNT that have presented this today. Uh, we are we are not sure what the um, how other banks are dealing with the situation, what they're anticipating. Uh, their scenarios to be, and that's why we thought the best thing to do is we probably have most of our representative banks today on this call introduce this scenario to you. Uh, maybe you can take it back to your uh, to your respective colleagues and determine if there's an interest in pursuing something 
obviously, uh, as has been outlined here, this would be some additional development that AFS would need to do, and we we probably take it through our our change control process. But it could possibly done be done not just by one one bank at a time, but uh, maybe with a group of banks. Uh, we did something like this several years ago around negative rate processing when it wound up being a, a group of level three banks that got together and we developed some additional capability. So there's an opportunity here um, at this point, you know, we're focused on delivering what we know we need to do and what we've outlined for, for SOFR, uh, but certainly would welcome uh, additional discussion around this point. Um, Again, a reminder here about dates. Uh, we are still on track with the dates that we have published before. So as I said, we're getting close to the end here, coming down to home stretch. As uh, you've seen the, the work in the system and uh, what we've developed and moving into our testing phase, and then we'll be deliver moving into delivery phase to get the updates out to each of our, our banks. We've collected a few questions uh, since our last webinar, and uh, I'll go through these uh, briefly. Uh, the first question was around observation shift and look back, and I think Charles and others have covered where we are with that. Unfortunately, we're still waiting for final guidance from the ARC committee for that. The, the number two release notes, you know, once that guidance is finalized, and we know this is, the functionality that's going to be delivered, uh, we will be able to provide additional documentation about that. Um, in, in terms of distribution format, Paul or Rich, I guess from the level three side, did you want to provide any updates as to how this is going to be distributed? Are we in a position to talk about that today? Uh, sure. Can you guys hear me? Okay. I think, Paul, you're a little choppy. You might be having some sound issues with Paul. Hey, hey, Dean, can you hear me okay? Yes, now I can. Go ahead. Uh, I might be, again, might be having, I apologize for the sound issues. What we had planned to do with these questions is provide responses, and then we will send an email out to the distribution list uh, who was invited to, to the webinars. So you will get updates about how we're planning to do the, the code uh, delivery. Um, there was a question number five about, I love the question about zombie LIBOR. Um, <laughs> again, other index options. At this point, the ones we've seen seem to fit within the capabilities that we have in level three and envision today. Um, in terms of mass updates, I think we're still looking at this being done on a case-by-case -case basis, but this is another topic that we're open to discussing further with banks based on their interest. And so if you want to reach out to us there, we can do that. Um, and then um, other questions about what financial institutions are doing to service loans today. Uh, again, before before the system is, is ready, uh, again, there are options. It depends, especially if you're a lead bank versus if you're maybe a member bank and another a syndication agent. Uh, you could certainly do a different interest accrual on your member portion and uh, true up the differences at the end of each billing period. Uh, it's it's not ideal, but it could be probably managed on a small uh, small volume of loans temporarily until you're ready for full production of of SOFR. And then the last question about calendar business days, again, goes back to the, the discussions that are still going on with, with the ARC committee. So we'll, we'll provide full responses to these and send them out. And then we'll schedule our next call probably sometime um, towards middle or late June where we'll have, uh, hope, I would hope, final guidance definitions. And really all then we'll be looking at is getting you the code updates and uh, then the fund begins, obviously, on your side, the testing and implementation process that you'll need to go through. Uh, Renee, anything else I need to cover today? 
Uh, no, we have no questions, and uh, I think uh, I think we're good. The only thing to remind everybody, we will be sending out a link so that you can uh, listen or download um, the recording of this presentation. Yep. As always, uh, thank you very much for your attendance, everybody. Uh, be safe, be healthy out there. Enjoy your Memorial Day weekend. We'll look forward to talking to you in a few weeks. Thank you, everybody.